Uh, yeah, so just a few words about myself. As I said, I'm in Onshkeli. Uh, I grew up in Israel. I used to be part of the red team of the Israeli army. And back then, I used to see many traditional technologies uh, like Java, ASP.NET, SAP, and very traditional concepts like multi-page applications, on-prem, waterfall, and so on. Because I used to perform pen testing for government, military, and financial organizations. Uh, after five years in the army, I decided to move to the US and start a new episode in the Silicon Valley in California. And I started getting exposed to new ideas uh, because I, I've been working mostly with startups and tier one companies. And I started getting exposed to Ruby on Rails, Node.js, Elixir, and very modern concepts like single page applications, cloud environment, CI CD, which are heavily based on APIs. And I basically had to adapt my mindset and to say, okay, in order to find vulnerabilities in this type of new environment, I have to, to understand what are the new threats. This is what let me, let me, led me to get into API security and write the OWASP top 10 for APIs. So I want to talk briefly about what's changed. What is the difference between traditional web servers and APIs? So if you take a look here on the top of the, of the screen, you can see the traffic patterns between client, web servers, and databases in traditional applications. Usually, the client would uh, send an API, uh, an HTTP call to get a specific web page from the web server. In this case, it's the home.jsp, the home page of the website. And then the web server would fetch data from database in order to, uh, to create a visual representation of this uh, web page, which is an HTML page that would be sent to the client. So the rendering process, the process of taking data and, uh, and creating the visual page would be done on the web server. And the client is like uh, not super sophisticated, just a browser that presents to the, to the user the HTML page. Today, in APIs, it looks very different. So clients know much better what they want. They ask for specific pieces of information, for example, uh, fetch the last 10 notification, uh, get the news from the last day, and so on. The web servers, in some ways, they act as a proxy between the client and the databases. They will just fetch data and return this data to the clients in a raw format of JSON. And the rendering process uh, of creating the visual page moved from the client, from the server to the client. So today, the client is responsible to create this visual page. Uh, a few other changes is that you have more types of clients. You can find on top of browsers, you can find like uh, IoT devices, mobile, and so on. And you have more types of databases. Um, and all of them speak the same language. Uh, they speak in JSON. So your uh, object that your uh, mobile application is processing might be the same object processed by your web server, and even the same object stored on the, on the database. Uh, so these changes lead to some good, uh, good news and also bad news. So let's start with the good news. First of all, things like SQL injection, uh, cross-site scripting, and XXC are much less common in APIs. That's because uh, the way that applications are built today. And the bad news is that APIs expose a much larger attack surface. Today, you have many more endpoints that attackers can try to manipulate. And you know, APIs today expose much more parameters and much more endpoints. And if you, if you ask every pen tester, they would tell you that every parameter that the client sends to the API, it's a potential place to try to inject something, to manipulate the input, and so on. APIs are also much more oversharing. There are less abstraction layers between the client and the servers. It makes it much easier for developers to use the APIs, but at the same time, it makes it much easier for attackers to understand the business logic just based on the traffic itself. And APIs are more predictable because the REST standard and the GraphQL standard encourage developers to develop APIs in a very generic and predictable way, which makes it much easier for attackers to understand which endpoints exist and to potentially make the attack surface larger. larger. So now I'm going to jump into the, I'm going to give you a few examples from the OWASP top 10 for APIs list. 
And the first vulnerability is broken object level visualization. This is the most critical API vulnerability. And I personally find it in every single API that I test, from small companies to large companies. So what happens in, a, in this type of vulnerability, the broken object level authorization, is that you have a client that sends an API call to the API that includes an ID of an object. For example, if you take a ride on a Uber or Lyft and you choose that you want to rate the ride five stars, right? This trip was amazing. So your client would send an API call to API slash trips slash rate trip uh, but the thing is, because you, you've taken many rides on this app, your client has to mention which ride ID you want to rate. And this is where the ID of the trip comes into the picture. And then what happens is that the developers that developed the API didn't actually check if the ID that you are trying to update belongs to a trip that you actually took. So what you could do as an attacker is to write a script to run over all the IDs of all the trips and to change all the ratings to five, to five or to zero. So this is just one quick example what you can do with Ebola, but there are many uh, more severe stuff you could do with this type of, of vulnerability. Uh, this is an example from Uber. It was found by Anand Prakash from AppSecure. Basically, it was full account takeover. So Anand found an API endpoint. You can see the get constant screen details. And the response contains all the information about the user. It contains the first name, the last name, uh, email, and even the authentication token. So what happens is that the, if during a legit uh, use of the app, the user, the user ID that would be sent from the browser would be the user ID of your own user, right? But then Anand just tried to change the ID his own user to an ID of someone else, and the, and the response contained uh, the information about the other user. So the developers didn't validate that this ID belongs to Anand, and he managed to get a full list of all the users on Uber, uh, including like riders and drivers. And as you can imagine, it's a very critical vulnerability on Uber because it basically had access to all of the users. Uh, let's talk briefly about number three. As part of the of the OS list, which is excessive data exposure, I personally find it as the kind of like my favorite vulnerability. Why? Because as a pen tester, you don't need to work really hard. Instead of like finding like tricky way to expose information, you just take a look at the traffic and to see. And the APIs would just click PII of other users by design. Uh, it sounds kind of weird. Why would APIs give you this opportunity to uh, steal data of other users? even if you don't try to do anything malicious. So let's take a look how it looks behind the scene. Um, so I'm using some dating app and I'm swiping right and left and then you see the profile of Bob. As you can see on the screen, everything is public. It's picture, name, hobby, something sensitive. But if I take a look at the API calls behind the scenes, it looks something like that. The API, the mobile client would send an API call to users slash 717, which is the ID of Bob. And then the response contains all the public information, but also the address of Bob, which is sensitive information. Uh, and this is something that happens a lot in API. Basically, the developers on the backend, they rely on the developers on the front end to filter out this information. And they actually did it. You can't see it on the UI itself. But this is a very bad idea, because every attacker that has access to tools like a Wireshark or any type of web proxy can easily see this information. Another example for this uh, uh, vulnerability, it was found on some other dating app called TreeFan app. Um, it's basically a dating app for swingers. And the researcher, Alex Lomas from Pentest Partners, found an API call. It's called uh, to the endpoint match users. And the response from this API endpoint contains all the users in your environment, in your area. Uh, and the response contains like information like the username, the user ID about me, but also uh, private photos of the user and the specific location of the user where using like the GPS. So what the next thing that Alex did was just to map all the users around the White House. And you can see the results here. 
pretty interesting. Um, I don't think we have enough time to talk about uh, Buffla, but in a very high level, it's, uh, it's a vulnerability that allows you as a regular user to access an admin endpoint because the developers don't check that the before you access an admin function, they don't check it to an admin, they don't check your group or a role. Uh, it was found in a Shopify that Akio managed to access an admin endpoint and to assign himself as a collaborator on a different shop on Shopify, just because the developers didn't check that he's an admin. Um, and I'm gonna move it to Dan. Great, thank you, Ian. Um, let's see, let me share my screen here. All right, so uh, what I would like to do, hi, I'm Dan Gordon. Um, technical evangelist here at Traceable. And what I'd love to do is show you a little bit of what Traceable does and how it can help detect and block the types of attacks that uh, Enon just uh, uh, showed us and told us about. Uh, and so you're looking right now at the main dashboard for the API intelligence part of Traceable. And you can see that we have lots of information about the APIs across the applications including a small app flow view, which we'll explode into in just a minute here. Uh, and this gives a good overview for our, our AppSec folks, uh, our, um, um, our, our security ops folks, uh, our product security folks, anyone in general, developers as well, of course, who have uh, the responsibility of making sure that the APIs, the services that they're putting out are secure. So let's dig in a little bit deeper. And what this view does is give us uh, a view that is discovered dynamically and always continuously updated of all of the services in our uh, in our application environment, our landscape. You can see there's quite a bit. Now, this is all the services, not just uh, um, a few that we have documented, but this is everything because we're watching the traffic and we're growing, learning from that and creating our baseline. So this has the north-south traffic um, that uh you know that that's that's sitting on our edge and what it's talking to internally um here we see like for example trace shop is talking to our front end which actually is talking to a lot of our internal services so we're also able to show uh, and catalog the uh the, the communications and dependencies of the internal services or east west traffic all the way back down to uh you know to to our our storage uh our, our storage services in the back and wherever we're keeping our data um this is really useful for just starters because what we find when we talk to a lot of folks is uh, they don't really have an overall picture of everything that they've got running and going on in their environment. Uh, and but but it's not just about the microservices, which we all know are proliferating quite a bit. Uh, but it's also very importantly about those APIs, right? So here we have our front end service. This is like Google Maps. You can kind of just keep clicking in and getting more and more detail. And uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we're, we're looking at the front end service detail now, uh, and we do have a general observability data, things like latency and errors and call, you know, calls and whatnot, overall health of the service, but also we have a catalog that is auto generated of all of the endpoints that are part of this service. And there's also a just overall endpoints um, up here where you can see everything across all of your, all of your application uh, landscape. What this does is that gives an inventory of all of the endpoints. It does a measure of uh, whether or not there's sensitive data being handled by that end, API endpoint, uh, whether or not it's authenticated. You generally don't want to see these two, especially if it's an externally facing, uh, and uses a few algorithms to present what we call the risk score, uh, which we're continuing to develop out, but basically looks at a lot of different criteria uh, to give a score about how risky that is, that can, uh, that API endpoint is, which can be used to uh, look at um, prioritization. You know, what should we be focusing on? What do we need to keep an eye on? Or what do we need to have, you know, our, our development team, you know, double click into? Um, and so uh, if we go even further in, we'll take a look at, for example, our checkout endpoint. Again, we have our observability data, but the real, Really cool stuff here is we've reversed engineered through the traffic from the traffic uh, 
what is the, the, the real state of this API? What is the specification for this API? What are all of the parameters? Uh, what, what types are they? Um, information about what is there that we keep about? What is the usual type of information that we expect to see in those parameters? Um, here's a little bit more detail on, uh, on the risk score, which as I mentioned, we're still kind of building out that, um, that those sets of algorithms. Uh, you know, for this endpoint, what are the uh, you know the typical kinds of users who connects to it, etc. And all of this data, and the reason I'm showing you this is because all of this data allows us to establish application context, um, and we call it the application DNA. And 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 this is really important because that context is what helps us to be able to, to detect uh, those those more sophisticated API logic attacks that uh, that Enon was just showing you. So we're talking about attacks. Let's get to that part because we protect as well. Uh, and this is super important piece. We look at all of the sessions, all the transactions that we see from a user perspective as much as we can. So you do see some IPs there because sometimes there's just not user data in the transaction, uh, but we can look and find uh, you, you know, user IDs, email addresses, token, you know, you know, drop tokens, uh, different ways to identify when a user is the same user and um, so, for example, that enables us to look at certain users and see, we'll pick this particular hacker who's, uh, who's not very stealthy with their name, uh, but this is, you know, a particular user and what we're able to do is auto, you know, is to see an auto-generated history of everything that this user has done across our systems, across all of our APIs, across our services, enough to be marked as critical, someone we need to watch out for, uh, and and we can see that there's quite a bit done here. So uh, we've detected out of the box things like cross-site scripting and you know your, your um, tr kind of traditional web attacks at this point, um, cross-site scripting, injection, um, you know, remote command execution, et cetera. Um, but here's the BOLA that Enon was talking about. Um, and we've uh, captured that uh, using the application context, looking at how the application baseline, uh, you know, uh, uh, works uh, and then finding anomalies and then going further and understanding. For example, here the user access the object that is not in alignment with an object that they should have access to. Right? And this is what you know again showed us just a minute ago. So we have information from requests and response and all the attributes of the transaction of, of the attack, um, as well as uh, the uh, basically the API attack chain, if you will, uh, to that point. So what can we do with this? We can block from the behavior perspective. We can also go and say, well, this user is a critical user. They've got all sorts of stuff going on, right? So we can block them from a user perspective, which will then block them across as a user, no matter where, which service they're attacking, which API they're trying to access. Um, we can suspend them if we need to put the brakes on them for a minute while we check some things or figure out what's going on. Uh, and then, you know, so, so forth all the way up the up the list there. Um, and one of the things that's really helpful if you're trying to understand uh, what is going on in an in incident and you kind of want to see everything uh, that uh, that is related to that suspicious behavior, well, we start with having this attack chain here, uh, but we can also go and get all of the details. Now, this takes us to our data lake of information of all of the traces of all of the transactions that happened and, and the relationships so that we can filter through and look for details. We can do some threat hunting, we can do forensics, and we can get a better understanding of what happened and, and uh, what data exchanged and what was the path to that, to that vulnerability. Uh, so this is looking at that particular session. It was this particular user that did it. Uh, and usually at, at most tools at this point, the challenge is, okay, now you need to start piecing logs and pulling things together. Uh, but because we're based on tracing, we automatically have that information. So here is effectively, if you will, the storyline of the API path and attack, uh, you know, of, of this session. Um, and we can go full expansion here. So you can see uh, the path of, of what happened, everything that went on, how long, you know, that, uh, that transaction was. Um, and you can go in and get the details, including the body, you know, and response information as well. So this allows for um, for better troubleshooting, uh, if you're if you're an engineer or if you're you know if you're trying to figure out what's going on, um, and 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 better uh, you know the ability to do forensics and really understand 
uh, what's going on post-mortem analysis, et cetera. Uh, now, uh, the last little piece I'll show, just a little dip into, because this is a, we're, we're kind of in beta with this, is we're also working on looking from the user behavior. And the reason we do that is because uh, we're looking for coordinated attack campaigns where it may be multiple users at multiple, you know, from multiple locations across multiple time zones. And what we're doing is we're actually looking for similarity in behavior. Uh, so for example, we'll go find our, uh, our, tip, our thing that we've been, uh, our attack that we've been looking at. Here's the authorization bypass or the BOLA. You can see that it's auto grouped all of those attacks. So if we look at the summary of that, this is the behavior, basically the signature that we see the APIs on the way to the attack and then what happens afterwards. And we can find those threats, those threat actors, and then take action on all of them, like block them, et cetera. And as I said, there's more work to do here, but I think this is uh, um, going to evolve into something pretty exciting. So that's my short, my super fast demo. Hope that was a uh, Hope that was good for y'all. Um, I'm going to switch over to Q and A now, so we'll um, toss it back to Iman. And thanks for listening. Thank you, Dan. Um, I see that we have a question from uh, Ahmed. Uh, how does the traceable get the API calls from the network? So we have many different deployment options. Some of them require you just to mirror the traffic to traceable. Uh, the other ones uh, would be using uh, in-app agents, but you're more than welcome to uh, schedule a call with us and we'll explain in, in depth about all the different options for deployment. Yeah. And hey guys, I wanted to mention here, you blew like right through that. We, we took five minutes of your time up front here. I wanna make sure that we get, you know, that we get that time that we've already shifted our next two speakers back by five minutes here. So. Um, if you want to pull back up here um, and, and do a little bit more demo, I am all about that. Um, and, and honestly, I think that it will be really valuable for the SANS community to see a little bit more of that. Um, if, if you've got it in it, you know, in you know, um, I, I'd be happy to see it. If not, we'll carry a conversation going here because the API security side is something that we are just not doing enough with. I, I think you'd agree in, in the in the industry today, right? So um, I don't know if you want to get your cohort back on here or do a little bit more demo here, Dan Gordon. Uh, coming back in here, but uh, Dan, you know, Enon, uh, you know, take take some time here. You got till uh, you know two twenty five Eastern uh, before we need to break. So please go Great. ahead, man. Thank you, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I just I'll, I'll I'll put on screen um, and then we'll turn back to Enon. Just one other thing that kind of took out of this, uh, you know, one of the two pieces that we have is vulnerabilities, uh, which will actually uh, identify vulnerabilities that it sees in APIs that are going by. As well, so um, again, something that uh, that we're continuing to develop out, but uh, uh, another piece of the puzzle with information about how to deal with those that I think is also very valuable. And that's part of the uh, what we call the intelligence the API intelligence, gathering information, collecting all that, um, uh, giving the uh, the inventory of the APIs, keeping that up to date, the document auto documentation, um, which very soon will be. Um, also exportable uh, to open API format. Uh, and then um, the protection part we talked about and then eventually the analysis. So all this kind of plays together. So, all right, well, I think we'll turn it back to Q&A. Yeah. yeah, sure. So I don't have uh, a bunch more uh, questions here in the, uh, in the chat yet, um, but uh, I, I would like to ask a question, I guess, um, and, and I'll ask, you know, uh, when you turn this on with customers, right? Um, obviously this is visibility that most folks just haven't seen before. Um, when you turn this on with customers, uh, what's, what's the number one finding that, that you get? Like the unsurprising thing, we're like, oh my gosh, we didn't know this was here. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think it has two different aspects because our product provides uh, both visibility and detection of a uh, live threat actor, right? So from like the, the visibility perspective, every time we deploy a product in a new customer environment, they're surprised about how many APIs they expose. Because like before the demo, they would assume maybe we have like, you know, 100 APIs, but then they see that they have like 200 and they have so many API endpoints that they never actually knew about them. No, some API endpoint that uh, a developer exposed uh, like a few years ago, 
and a developer left the company and now nobody knows about this specific API endpoint, about this specific microservice. So this is something that we see with, I think, almost every customer that we have, just those uh, shadow APIs, zombie APIs um, that are like not updated. There is no documentation for these APIs. Mm -hmm. We provide you the option to see that they actually exist and uh, to, to understand what are the threats they bring with them. And from the attacker's perspective, it's interesting that even customers that are just deployed in a non-production environment, like a QA or staging, uh, they still see a bunch of threat actors because the reality is like the, the internet today is, is a very uh, scary place. Uh, there are bots and attackers that just scanned uh, all the IP addresses. And even if you have some QA environment that nobody knows about, you would still have attacks going on on it. I think this is the second thing. I think that's that's really fantastic, right? Um, you know, as an incident responder, I can tell you that, uh, or I can back you up on, I guess, and say that uh, there are definitely QA environments exposed to the, uh, sad, sadly, very often tied to production environments, but but QA environments exposed to the public internet that uh, people would swear on, a, you know, just like say, no, it definitely is not out. And then of course that ends up being the, the source of the breach. Dan is smiling as if he's been there, done that, and has the proverbial t-shirt, but but of course, uh, you know, we see that, um, you know, so the number of APIs and then uh, do, do you want to tell a war story here? Uh, maybe about some, oh yeah, you literally have the t-shirt on. I love it. I, have, I love it. Love it. You couldn't have scripted that any better. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank, th thank you. I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just set it up and you're like, what? knock it out of the park. But if you don't um, mind me saying, then if you go to our website and, and kind of explore around, uh, there is the opportunity to, to get a couple, there's a couple of these that we have, uh, vaccinature APIs, et cetera. So yeah, check it out. Okay, well, there we go. So um, like that, I definitely like that. Uh, by the way, I, I'm always about like the, hey, we've got some swag if you look around for it. That, that, those, those, are the, those are the cool ones, right? Um, so do either you have a war story that you wanna tell about like, hey, this was, and, and obviously you can't get into customer names. We know that, right? But, but a war story about like, hey, here's a, an API that we didn't know about or visibility we didn't know about. We turn this on and oh my gosh, Right, like not just like, hey, we're shocked to find this, but like here's an actual threat actor intrusion, um, you know, through an API. Yeah, so and these are always so hard. Think, I'm putting you on the spot, but yeah. Yeah, no problem. Obviously, I, I won't mention any names, but I would say it was one of the big companies that uh, does food delivery, mm -hmm. these type of companies, and they have they have millions of users. Uh, and I was trying to find some some vulnerabilities in their APIs, and I found a way to gain. It was a very tricky test, and I actually I actually used uh, because I didn't have full access to the production environment. I had to go to the QA environment, as we just talked, because they exposed the QA environment to the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the QA environment, they exposed more information that helped me to understand the API better, like the Open API spec. Uh, but the the fun, the fun part was that I could use the same open API spec both for the QA and the production. So the the exposed QA environment helped me to understand better the production environment. Uh, and after doing some research, uh, I mean, it was kind of a long process. It contained a few different vulnerabilities. But after doing some research about the open API spec and how the APIs interact with each other, I managed to find a way uh, to gain full account takeover. I could mm -hmm. log in on behalf of each user on this environment. It was a combination of a few different authorization bypass vulnerabilities. Um, and they also had two-factor authentication mechanism that require you to basically to authenticate using like an SMS token. Mm -hmm. uh, but this the, the, the API call uh, of the login, it contains like a few steps. One of them is to, to validate the SMS token, right? Uh, but the interesting thing about REST APIs, it was like API slash V3 slash uh, uh, validate token. And I just tried to change the V3 to V1 and I managed to get to a login endpoint that didn't actually validate the token. This is how I managed to bypass this uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, it took me a few days to like chain all the vulnerabilities together, but it was really fun to gain full access to all the users. I mean, fun, fun for me, not, not fun from them, obviously. Well, no, of course. And, 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 you know, what we're talking about here, when you start talking about full account takeover, right, and the reputational risk of that and the, 
And the fact that we typically don't just have, we just don't have visibility on that in, in most cases. Um, you know, I think that's a great illustration of, you know, where a, a, a product like yours that provides that visibility, you know, co comes in. And one thing that I'll close with here, you know, and I'll leave, obviously leave this for you guys closing thoughts, but, uh, you know, I'll just mention that, uh, you know, the vast majority of folks that I talked about APIs, are, hey, don't worry about web server logs. And I'm like, have you ever looked at those and tried to pull that apart? Because nobody that has says those words, right? You've got the load balancer problems, the X4 and 4 configurations, and the myriad problems that I know you guys are experts in. But, um, you know, I'll give you closing thoughts here and, and, and we'll, we'll transition to the next speaker. Go ahead. Don, do you have any inputs here? Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I love this conversation and, and, uh, and thank you for, for giving us some time to have it. You know, I think um, the, the big message is, is, is that, you know, we, we, we do a lot to secure all of the layers, right? The Kubernetes layer, the OS layer, even parts of the application, the web server layer, et cetera. Um, and, and this is, even though it's been around for a while, uh, it, it, it's it seems that it's it's the, the API, if you will, layer uh, is is more vulnerable and not quite yet protected the way that it needs to be. So, you know, that's really what we want to do is get the word out um, and and help provide tools. Um, and we do, do we do have a free version uh, to be able to you know to to help people understand and start learning more about you know problems like bola sometimes happen because you know authorization wasn't done properly authentication yeah. was right so this is a learning thing and we all need to work together as an industry to to educate um, everybody so awesome well hey guys thank you so much really appreciate the conversation and i know i put you on the spot a couple of times but i appreciate the candor and thanks guys really appreciate it thank that you was great. so much thank you very much